Hey, welcome to this first edition of Ask Barry V Show. This is going to be a podcast that you can download on iTunes and listen at your convenience. This is also going to be on uh, YouTube. Uh, and the way you ask us questions is you can either hashtag Ask Barry V, and we can see those on Twitter, or you can go to our YouTube channel, and underneath the videos you can be asking us questions. You can also email me uh, at CEO at BarryVanover.com, any questions that you may have. I want to introduce the Vice President of Martial Arts Management Group and Premier Martial Arts International, Miles Baker. Uh, as you can see, we're just in our office, uh, in our normal everyday clothes, nothing special. We just want to share with you some questions. I get a lot of questions uh, via texting and via email from owners all over the country, and we thought it would be kind of cool to every week pick a few of these questions and share them with everyone. So, Mr. Baker, you're going to ask the questions. Let's just go ahead yep. and get started. Yeah. First question we have today is John G. asks, how can I drive more people to my website? You know, uh, the thing about websites and SEO and web internet marketing, what I have found is everybody, lots of people think they know about this conversation and this answer, and everybody's an expert, but yet everybody will tell you two or three different things. So I'm not an expert on website uh, marketing necessarily or SEO at all, but I have done our due diligence and studied this information. And what we have found, for example, is some information that we were studying. A professor from the University of Chicago, uh, David Kramer, uh, he did a study. Uh, he had over 300,000 people visit a website that they marketed, because this is a school of communications in Chicago. And what they found in this study was 39% of these people came from what's called direct traffic. Direct traffic is when someone types in your website URL directly into the search bar, right? So they already know of you. They already know, even know your website address. So that's direct traffic. For almost 40% of the people that go to a website already have heard of the company, and they're going directly to your website. The next type of uh, traffic that goes to a website is called referral traffic. Referral traffic is when someone cl clicks a link from another website or the Internet to get to your website. Now, for more short schools, we find that's probably mostly social media. That's your Facebook, your Instagram, your Pinterest for moms. Uh, and it could be Google AdWords, of course. So Google AdWords, you know, depending upon they're clicking on your ad and it's taking them to the website. So that's about 25% of the traffic. Now, true SEO meaning that someone's putting in phrases like children's martial arts classes, Toledo, uh, Krav Maga classes, Knoxville, and then websites appear from the SEO rankings, that makes up for about 36% of traffic to a website. So it's something, SEO is something that's important. We need to look at, um, and we'll do that maybe in an uh, upcoming training. But really, if you look at this, minimum of 65% of traffic to your website comes from areas offline marketing, people that have heard from you from word of mouth, from your promotional booths, from your martial arts birthday parties, uh, from from your rack card routes, from your, you know, your wrapped mobile vehicles, all these different ways that people offline marketing hear from you is driving the majority of business to your website. Um, and then, of course, SEO is important, uh, but it's something that I would recommend if you're concerned about SEO. The first thing is, do you need SEO? Do you need SEO? If you're already one, two in your area, you don't have tons of competition, I wouldn't spend the money going to a company to do specialized SEO for me. Um, those that you are in markets with lots of martial arts schools, highly competitive markets, you're going to spend $500 to $1,000 a month on a good SEO company. Now, they will put you number one for periods of time as long as you're working with them, but that's going to be something that you have to put in your ongoing budget. So there's my thoughts on Web traffic. I totally agree. I mean, every time that we have a new client that comes on that hasn't experimented with snipe signs, um, wrap cards you mentioned, or wrapping their car, their website leads always go up within the month. So, and it's definitely about the intensity of you know the volume that's out there in the community, but it's always a direct correlation. Website leads drop a little bit. Ask yourself, have I been doing a lot of offline marketing? Right. Uh, if not, get back out there and increase your volume, and you'll see within four weeks that your website leads definitely come back up. Totally agree there. Uh, our second question for today, uh, Karen asks, what do you think of door hangers as a form of marketing? I think door hangers, if you think about taking, you know, marketing in general is taking the right message to the right people via the right method. 
if you really think about it, door hangers are ingenious. You're taking an exact message, put it in on a door that mom is eventually going to find. Somebody in the family is going to find the door hanger, right? And it goes to the right person. The problem is the method the method of delivering these door hangers. You don't know how many martial arts schools I visit when I do school evaluations. I'm sure you've seen it too. And you're looking at some of their marketing materials at what they actually have to work with, which is part of our process. And I always find a bunch of door hangers that's never been put out. So everybody thinks it's a good idea and it actually is a great idea. The problem is the method. It's hard to find the manpower and time to go out and put out enough door hangers to have an impact and do it consistently. So though it's a great idea, I really doubt that most owners are going to do what it takes to have an impact on door hangers of going out and actually distributing them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is. It's about man, use of manpower. I agree 100%. Uh, and, and plus, even if you do have the manpower to do door hangers or neighborhood flyer, there's just so many more systems that you need to make sure that you have going full bore and totally in place before you go to something like a door hanger that's so labor intensive. Uh, so our third question for today, uh, Sean R. asks, how do you handle special needs students in your classes? Yeah. You know, this is, uh, this is a good question. Um, you know, martial arts, every martial arts school that I know that has over 200 students, they do a fairly great job at character development and making sure that families see the mental and personal development side of the martial arts other than just the physical side. You know, when you look at the fact that we run ads that target moms tr talking about we're going to develop confidence in their children and, and respect and perseverance, incre increase their focus and attention span, which we do, absolutely do in our program. Uh, I think uh, the students that study martial arts make better grades than students that do a lot of other activities because we concentrate so much on character and personal development. Even doctors recommend us for ADD and ADHD, right? The problem is depends on what kind of special need it is and how special the need actually is. We have to be realistic and honest that we're not set up to handle individual people and kids in a group class. We're kind of doing them an injustice if we take one of these students and put them in the class that has extreme autism, that they constantly have to be brought back to focus. And, and or, you know, you had a student that you can tell them about that had the, um, had the uh, Asperger's. Was it Asperger's? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, how disruptive it was for the class. Um, uh, but we're just not set up for that. You know, we're not really set up to take ha extreme handicaps of – of kids that can't walk or in wheelchairs in a group class setting. So I think we really just have to understand our limitations. And if it's a, if it's a, a special need that we can overcome and actually be helpful with it, then by all means, that's what we're here for. But if it's a special need that we realistically can't work with, we can't do them justice, and it's going to interrupt all of our other paying students, I say we'd be honest with the parent and explain that we're just not, our business is not set up to handle that. Yeah, honesty definitely is the best policy. I think parents respect that. Um, you know, I can't imagine a lot of the challenges those parents face and uh, they're looking something that is unique that's going to help their child. And in many cases, we may be able to, to, to do that for them. But definitely during the introductory course is a great time to evaluate. If you do private introductory courses and you're still not sure, you may want to have them go ahead and try a group course and see how they, they interact because a lot of times the disabilities uh, you may not see. It's very prominent in a one-on-one -on -one setting, but you get them in a group setting. And, and like you mentioned, if it's just simply detracting from the rest of the class and bringing down the level of the class because so much time has to be focused on that student, you know, really suggesting something like private lessons is probably the, the only other option. But I think, you know, the worst thing that could happen is we, we say yes to everybody when we're not equipped to handle them and a, a, a parent is now paying and is a, is a, a, a customer of ours, um, but they can see that it, it just isn't working out for right. their child. And so I think they right. sometimes feel like they're misled. So. You know, something to add to that is a, a friend of mine, Zach Siokas, down in Columbia, South Carolina. He actually has a special need class on Saturdays for, I believe, if my memory serves me correct, it was all ages, but it was all ages with any type of special needs. And he actually gets grant money from the state that pays for these people and it's pretty sizable amount of money on a monthly basis 
uh, because the, the grant pays for a, a person to take that special need class as a course for six or eight weeks, and then they have to pay again for them to continue. Huh. So it's a good income generator, and you're putting the special needs people in a class that you can get enough instructors oh, yeah. and really manage and not disrupt your current students. So I think that's something we all should look into of grant opportunities if you really are wanting to have that impact for special needs people in your community. That's, that's pretty cool. I've never heard of that. Well, that would be a really cool opportunity. Uh, our next question is from Mike B, and he asked, how do you conduct your staff meetings? Which I think is a great question. We get that a lot, and uh, we have the schools here with lots of different managers. So right. now what are your thoughts on staff meetings? I think staff meetings are key to whether you're a one-man show and your staff meeting is you setting down to spend some quality time by yourself and doing your proper planning, or you have a team of people at your school that you have to direct and focus and lead, or you have multiple locations like the six locations we have here uh, where we have to bring our entire team in and, and focus each manager on, on the task at hand. So like we do here, we have staff meetings Monday and Wednesdays. Um, in the staff meetings, we always start off with a victory uh, since the last time that we met. Um, uh, the victory may be a personal victory for the staff. It may be a victory, a business victory. Uh, we just want to start off the staff meeting as pos positive as possible. Then we go into any challenges, any again, personal challenges, staffing challenges, anything that we need to put on the table for the team to solve a problem uh, right off the bat. Then we go into student concerns. Are there any problems with parents, with students? Anything to do with the curriculum, the lessons, the schedule, situations that happen on the floor, and we handle that and we plan that immediately. Then we turn our attention to our numbers, uh, and which is our statistics. So on Mondays, we look at our statistics and our performance numbers from last week results and month to date. Then on Wednesdays, we look at what we've done so far this week, Wednesday being in the middle of the week, what we've done so far this week and month to date again also, okay? So um, that those numbers, when we're discussing those numbers, that really dictates a lot of the conversation in the staff meeting. If the numbers are any certain area, the statistic or the goal is not being met or the statistic is off the percentage, then we focus on that as our training in our staff meetings. So that's very important. Then we move into marketing upcoming marketing, marketing ideas, results from marketing from last week, where are we going to come up with our, our do we have enough leads to get our power appointment goal this, this week, uh, how did we do last week in our marketing, what we've got coming up, all the marketing events and planning. Then we do any upcoming to-dos and action list or task list. And that could be anything from changing the lights to make sure a certain thing is fixed or a certain area is cleaned. Just some last minute to-dos that we want done before the next meeting. Now at our schools, we do Monday, Wednesday staff meetings. And as long as the staff is on target uh, on Wednesday and everything looks good, great. Otherwise, we may call another staff meeting on a Friday to make sure we tighten up loose ends. Because remember, if you take your monthly goal, and Mr. Baker was so good at this when he was our, our program director and manager at one of our schools, he was so good at taking his monthly goal, breaking it down into a weekly amount and breaking it down into a daily amount. And every single day he knew whether he was on track or whether he was off track. So by being able to look at that a couple times a week helps keep you on track and it increases to ensure that you actually hit your, your goals. Yeah, I mean, the, from in-house revenue numbers to appointment numbers, 24 hours makes a big difference. So uh, even if you're, I think meeting once a week is a big mistake. Some people don't meet at all. Um, to look at those numbers, every manager or owner knows those numbers every 24 hours where they're at. But if you have a bigger team or multiple schools, definitely bring them together twice a week, like you mentioned. Uh, I really enjoy the accountability. Um, when I was uh, a program director, it wasn't a thing to be fearful. It was a thing that it, it gave me a reason to hit the goal. I knew that we were going to come together. I knew we were going to meet. And I wanted to be proud of the goals we had set and, and had those accomplished by the time, whether it was certain amount of appointments or new students upgrades, whatever it was. And then the victories are always fun. Uh, you know, staff meetings should be a time that, it's fun. You're celebrating new right. signups and, and this and that. And like you said, personal, personal victory. So I think uh, staff meetings should be something that everybody looks forward to a great place to, to get organized. And again, to look at those numbers at least twice a week and sometimes a, a third time of the week, if we're a little behind, because it really does keep us focused every day where we're at and, and uh, chasing our, our goals. 
because we can get behind so fast. Four weeks goes by like that. Now, that's probably one of the big areas I see owners fail on is organized staff meetings, staff training for their team. Uh, when I ask them about when they conduct their staff meetings or you know what they do in the meeting, they're, they're usually uh, having problems explaining how that system happens because the system probably isn't happening. Just tips, remember, as an owner, try to be prepared when you go into the staff meeting of what you're going to cover and talk about. You don't want to take up people's time, make it boring like Mr. Baker said. You want to keep it as short as possible. You want to spend enough time to get business done and, and pay attention to certain areas, but you also want to make it short and sweet. You don't want to, you don't want to make it something that the, the team look, uh, doesn't look forward to or, or they dread it. Uh, and like you said, make it fun, make it f exciting. Uh, we have any other questions? On That's there? it for today. Okay. Yeah. So remember, you guys can ask questions. Uh, on Twitter, hashtag Barry V. I'm sorry, hashtag Ask Barry V. And you can go to our Martial Arts Management Group uh, YouTube channel, and you can view the show. Of course, if you're viewing it now, you're already there, right? And you can put even under the videos, you can ask questions or comments or so forth, or you can email us uh, at CEO at BarryVanover.com. Any questions that you guys may have? I want to really quickly mention that October the 15th, 16th, and 17th, we have our Martial Arts Management Group and Premier Martial Arts International uh, 2015 Symposium. This is a business and martial arts training symposium. So what's some of the martial arts that we have happening? Uh, we've got uh, Gung Suk, Sal Pungent, famous Thai boxer coming in. Uh, so very excited about that. Uh, Mr. Ernie Kirk, the president of Krav Universal, will be here doing uh, nothing but it's gun, fun. which is going to be super exciting. Three days of different a aspects of gun, whether it's gun def and it's all handgun, gun defense, carjacking, uh, any situations with the gun so, uh, uh, whatsoever. Yeah, so what else we got? Uh, of course, it's Master Ken. How could we leave out Master Ken? We've got Master Ken exciting. from Enter the Dojo, uh, the YouTube sensation show. He's going to be at our awards dinner that night and banquet dinner that everybody's invited to come to. And he's going to be doing a presentation and sharing his martial arts knowledge with us. We've got uh, Boca Oliveira is going to be doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu training. Uh, and we have Trevor Clarkston, Trevor Clarkston is going to be doing uh, advanced Kali training. Kali. So that stuff looks really good. Now, on, on the business topics that we have... Um, on Thursday morning at 9 o'clock, I'm starting off with an instructor college. Two days, nothing about the classroom floor. doesn't matter what style of martial arts you teach. It's all about the classroom floor, making sure that it's fun, exciting, and educating for your students. Talk about increasing your retention and billing your billing check. It's all about that classroom floor. At the same time, in another area, Mr. Baker is going to be doing a program director's training. Yep, super excited. So going over um, basic marketing responsibilities for program directors, Two lesson trial programs, upgrade procedures, um, everything from uh, our sales logs, our lead logs. So lots of really good information for anybody who's got managerial tasks to, to right. accomplish at the school. When we build a profile, when we have a new customer come in and start working with us in our consulting, we build a profile on their school. And nine out of ten times, the majority of money that the owner is making is directly tied to his tuition billing check. The program director's training that Mr. Baker teaches is the secret to doubling your gross revenue and bringing in in-house cash in the form of down payments, paid in full, equipment package sold on new memberships and upgrade memberships. You want to make, you want to bring in more money fast and grow your business, double your gross revenue, that program director's training. And not only program directors need to go to it, but owners and managers because you've got to hold your staff members accountable you need to know those business systems uh whatsoever that's it when we look at how we can make somebody money the easiest place for us to turn to is their two lesson trial their their introductory procedures whatever it may be because most people are just letting people try six weeks of class and then trying to sign them up that's not an effective way to get down payments paid in fulls you're never going to take people straight to a three-year black belt commitment from the intro process that way so that's an important training. Then on Friday at 4 o'clock, once mine and his Friday and Saturday instructor college and program directors train off, we start business seminars for owners and managers. We've got Amanda Stein coming in that's a, that runs a company that handles people's Facebook marketing and advertising. We've got people coming in that are going to be working on uh, doing AdWords in, uh uh, internet solutions that that concentrate on handling a school's AdWords. They're going to be giving us tips and and how tos on that. We've got uh, Mr. Al Garza, pr uh, premier martial arts owner in Austin and Houston, Texas, is going to be doing a leadership. He's gotten certified with John Maxwell 
in uh, leadership. He's going to be doing a presentation. I'm going to be covering tons of marketing. Uh, Mr. Baker is going to be presenting some new programs that we have, anti-drug programs for kids. We've got a new self-defense workshop for, for more for your mass intro or adult self-defense workshops that we're going to be presenting. We have tons and tons of stuff. You can see all the details at mamgsym.com. So martial arts management group symposium.com uh, for more details and to get registered. All right, anything else? That's it for this week. All right, thank you guys so much. We'll see you again next time at Ask Barry V.